So we've had a, a discussion to talk about well, long-range lens. Uh, the world is changing dramatically. Uh, I, I can't pull it out right now because if I do, I'll upset all the wires that are holding me up here. But I was going to pull out my phone and talk about the fact that my phone, your phone, which by the way, make sure you've turned it to silent, but your phone has more power to it, more, more in information available through it than the astronauts that went to the moon had in terms of all of their equipment. That's just amazing. That is just an amazing piece. Libraries are changing. They're no longer storing books, but they're trying to teach us how to use information, et cetera. Uh, we've got incredible different kinds of things available to us. So we need to step back and say, OK, who are we? What are we going to do? Where are we going in the future? So I want to spend some time with all of us having a discussion. And I was able to get some really great people to join us in this discussion. And remember, it's discussion, and we invite you to participate in the process. We've got some great panelists. I'm going to ask them to come on up to the stage now, uh, if you can make it. And I'm going to introduce them when they come up. Somebody, OK. OK. So let me start by introducing our panelists. Uh, Laura Noss, uh, an old friend, a, a colleague of, of mine. She's the principal and education practice leader for Lyonakis. She has a bachelor's, a, a, a bachelor of Science in Architecture and a Master's from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, and she's been at this for 30 years. Her, her, we asked, you know, what's your greatest achievement? And she says, uh, really balancing her career and family. And that's an important piece that we're beginning to learn. And it's not just because women, it's about men and women. How do we balance our lives so that we can really do what we do well? And she says that she did that while paying, paying her dues. And the important thing is that now her kids are out there paying their own dues. She doesn't have to do that one anymore. Well, uh, Brett Young, uh, founder and CEO of Building SP. Is that the way you pronounce it? I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> OK. Uh, Brett Young is the founder and CEO of Building SP. It's a software uh, development firm focused on improving workflows and uh, for building information modeling, uh, software products, et cetera, that are used around the world now. And he brings a great, great perspective for, for all the technology that's changing our direction. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil and Environmental Engineering from UC Berkeley, uh, 18 years of uh, local industry experience, total uh, industry experience uh, with projects range from elementary schools uh, to microchip fabrication plants. So thank you and we welcome you. Uh, Pablo uh, Manzo, Vice Chair Los Rios uh, CCD. Community College District, Associate Vice Chancellor, Los Angeles, uh, was the Associate uh, Chance Vice Chancellor for Los Rios Community College District, Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. The engineers have got us, Laura. We've got to be careful. We, be careful with what we do here. Uh, Regional Director and Program Manager in the Higher Education Market for Kitchell, uh, Acadis, a great background in terms of all aspects of, of, of educational facilities. Uh, He's really had a, a, made a quantum leap uh, forward in expanding and improving uh, the educational facilities uh, where he's worked and, and done a great job. <clears throat> Kathy Allen, old friend from, from CASH, uh, my involvement with CASH. Uh, she's currently Chief Operations Officer for Facilities Support Services for Sac City uh, Unified School District. Before that, she was the Chief Operations Officer at Sacramento City Unified School District. And uh, she has a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration. Uh, and uh, she was the president, I guess called chair, chair, chair of CASH, uh, put on some great, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, meetings, <laughs> lost that word completely, <laughs> conferences, uh, and has done an amazing job in building relationships with the entire design and construction industry. And then Dave Finn, project executive for Black uh, Construction Company, project executive for 14 years. Prior to that, uh, uh, spent at other various other uh, construction companies, a bachelor uh, uh, a BA in management at St. Mary's College in, here in California. And uh, his achievement was raising four children, but not quite done yet. Is that right? <laughs> uh, 
it's hard. <laughs> I have determined that being a grandparent is better, and if I would have known how good it was, I would have done that first and just <laughs> forgotten about the kids <laughs> in total. Then we were tight, but, yeah. <laughs> oh, we didn't have another. Well, anyways, I wanted to start talking about a number of different issues, and I want to start with Laura uh, and really ask the question about uh, what, what's changing in terms of the educational process and how is it affecting design? Okay. Okay. So I think the things that we see most often, um, one is the change of delivery models. So um, a lot of teachers are using more technology, obviously, in the classroom, but they're also using different delivery methods. Uh, Chet had that great image of the drafting room up there. One could say there was a similar model of the classroom um, s uh, facing forward, all at individual desks, and we certainly see that changing. I always say at the risk of putting ourselves out of business, uh, furniture, right, is a big change in what we see in how classrooms are changing and the delivery of education. Um, flexibility is more important. Project spaces are more important. So again, we're looking at all of these 960 square foot rooms that we have built and this enormous infrastructure that we already have in place. But really what teachers, educators, students, families are looking for is a little more space so that they can break into small groups, so that they can uh, work on project-based learning. I always say that I think um, everything we needed to know we learned in kindergarten. And one of the things that we learned in kindergarten was was that there was a lot of space for kids to move around and learn in different ways and act in different ways in classrooms. So if I had my one wish uh, in the crystal ball, it would be that we could provide a, a little more space, a technology backbone that was really robust and um, that flexibility of furniture for both the students um, and the educators. So I want to go over to, to the construction side and say, okay, we need more than 960 square feet. What's the impact going to be on construction costs and how do we justify it because, because we need it, <laughs> but yet we've got to cut costs. Well, we all know where the, the market's going right now. So space, um, space is a, a difficult thing. So I, I think one of the things we're, we're all looking at is, is ways that we can do things sort of better, faster, cheaper. How do we develop space in a, in a way that we haven't done so before? Do we do, do, are we building differently? We're trying to build differently today. Um, I know one of the things we're trying to do with a, with a, a folio building is we're, we took a look at what, how could we do the process better? We're talking about doing things better and, and, and creating learning spaces that are, that are done differently than we've done before. So we partnered with, a, with an architect and, and took a look at how, how this, is, this building is designed. But at the same time, when we went through that design process, we looked at how, how are these guys gonna put it together? How could we build it better? So we talk about collaboration and that sort of thing. I think this is with the, the epitome of co collaboration. And, and we're able to create space, as, as Laura's talking about, at a, at a different price range and, and much quicker. And I think, I think Chet, I think DSA has really made an effort to be quicker in terms of the, the process and the turnaround and design and that sort of thing. And so we as builders have to find ways to do it a lot more quickly as well. And so uh, this type of, of building I think really helps us to do that. And, and um, I kind of got off space a little bit, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it really is germane to what we're talking about. Okay. Well, Brett, that's an interesting piece because we're talking about collaboration and you, I think you're involved in collaboration tools. How do, how do we do this better? And if yeah. I can just interrupt for a second. Feel free, raise your hand if you want to jump into this. This is conversation. We happen to be sitting on a podium, but we really want you to involve yourself. So go ahead, Brett. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we've, we've been doing BIM for, what, 10 years now? I don't know when. Maybe a little, yeah. a little longer. And yeah. we've, we've gotten pretty good at it, I think. Um, but the real opportunity we, we find is uh, to go and really kind of move upstream a little bit and automate more and more of design, provide better tools that are more integrated and allow people to do class checking and things like that without having to go into a meeting and go and do it. And um, 
that's really the opportunity, I think, to, to kind of drive the collaboration, kind of really kind of change the, um, the, the tenor of how we go about and go do that. Make it a more virtual, virtual and automated process. And by fixing design, or not fixing, but improving design and providing better tools, that'll enable more downstream um, functionality. Yeah. Kath, oh, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, Pablo. I was going to say, the other thing that uh, we, we do, and especially in an environment where there's such a high cost associated with the space, is uh, you know, trying to find that line between want and need. And um, you know, we always know what, what uh, our uh, users want, but we don't necessarily get what they need and, and unless you do a little digging on your own. And um, so one of the ways that we try to deal with the, the, the costs that we're seeing uh, to build these facilities is to make sure that we build space that's actually, again, flexible, but also uh, needed. So in other words, uh, are we making the best use of the space that we have? Uh, are there empty classrooms in buildings that are just not being used? Are we, are we planning those spaces uh, correctly so that we're not building a new building when in fact we have classrooms and other places on the campus that could be used for you know, that, the purpose of educating our students? So uh, space planning for us has become a bigger and bigger piece of it. It also has the added benefit of allowing you to, be, uh, to program your buildings better, right? To make them more efficient. So you have uh, two buildings being used on campus and uh, one of the buildings has got all the air handlers running, but you only got two classrooms being used in there. But that second building has two open classrooms that no one's using. You know, what about moving those classes? You know, if you can do that, uh, move those two classrooms into that building and shutting down a building completely. Um, so there's, there's that as well. Just the ability to plan not just the space, uh, differentiating about what you need and want, and then making use of the space you have as efficiently as possible. And of course now with some of the tools that we have, you can actually program that graphically, right. <laughs> which, which really helps, at least for us, us folks. That look well, it's at a bit it. of a paradigm shift too for faculty and folks because uh, my experience is they don't like to share. And so uh, they have their little kingdoms and, and, they, and they get very protective of that. So you kind of have to change the, the thought, the culture a little bit about that. But I, I think when, if they're committed to sustainability and being efficient with what we have, then I think they eventually you know, realize that that's the right way to go. You said something about changing the culture. Uh, there's a big movement towards change management when people move. Uh, I, I happen to be sitting on the executive team for the two high rises here in Sacramento that are going to go on one on P and one on O Street. And we've talked a lot about we're taking 3,000 people and moving them into a building. That's a change. Do we need more change management in, in the school process? Because when, when people move, how do, they, how do they learn to do things differently? Uh, Kathy, we're... So my, my mind immediately goes to bargaining units. <laughs> um, I mean, reality is, you know, that kind of behavior or that kind of change, that kind of request um, isn't an everyday thing for a teacher. Um, I was talking to uh, someone from Twin Rivers Unified at the conference. Um, she said they make teachers pack up all their stuff every June um, and take it home. You know, they, didn't, they don't like it, but um, the, the room is essentially ready to go for any teacher who would walk in there with their stuff. Um, I, I, that's kind of drastic. I think I love that because I think I could actually get the room clean. Um, but I think it would require an active conversation with, with the bargaining units on how that could happen, make it uh, palatable as much as possible. Um, folks want to get paid every time they work past their normal work hours. Um, and then I think the biggest issue, again, is the, the folks that have been doing this for a really, really long time um, just don't want to change. And, and I go back to the days when computers started showing up on our desks and uh, there was a, a woman that worked across from me and she said, just don't even bother putting that thing on my desk. I'm going to retire in less than a year. And so she went the rest of her year without ever having a computer on her desk. I mean, she was just that stuck, stuck in her ways and she was not going to learn that. Um, so change, change is almost, I think, harder than adapting to new technology or um, you know, a new way to teach and learn. So. Well, the interesting process, the thing rather, is that uh, in the change management, those that are doing, uh, that are we want to call experts in this whole process. They they think about about the five days, five ways of grie of of death of grieving. You're grieving for the loss of your pencil. You're grieving for the loss of your room. That's a di whole different place to apply this stuff. 
So yes. as architects, right, I think we're by nature sort of optimistic. Um, so I like to think of uh, that paradigm shift, the building or the revised or renovated building as being that catalyst uh, for change and using it as an example, a teaching tool, an opportunity for teachers or others that may be stuck in their ways to look through a new lens. And I think we've had a lot of success with that. Not everyone, for sure. But even one of Kathy's projects that we recently worked on where people moved from the old part to the new part, um, you could see their eyes light up and get excited about having these new opportunities in teaching. So, you know, managing change is sometimes um, putting your toe in the water. Well, there's a, one of the big changes that we're going through right now is this whole process of, of project delivery. There are still some that say the only way is design, bid, build. Of course, that's turned into design, bid, build, litigate. It's a four-step process now. And we're going through these changes, and how do we, <laughs> and how, how, do we, how, do, where do, how do we deal with this thing? Because we still have, uh, you know, although design professionals, construction professionals are doing it one way, there's still people sitting on a board of, of trustees or a board of education saying, well, but wait a second, we've got to go out competitively. How do we handle this when we know that that's causing us some problems? Well, change, uh, and we talk about my degrees in management, so I remember a number of, of classes on change management and that sort of thing, but painting the picture of success, letting people see what that success is going to look like in the future. It may not be that way right now, but it will get there, and there's gonna be some hiccups along the way, but you have to celebrate and encourage those things along the way, because you're always gonna have some folks that don't that don't want to change, but once they see success going on, it becomes something that that actually becomes successful across the the whole organization. But in in terms of of construction and and change, um, I, I think it's some of the same sorts of ideas. And when you get someone who's a real design bit build guy, it's like I've been doing this for 35 years, and and I know that's how it is, and. I don't worry too much about litigation and that sort of thing, but we have to show them, and we, we try to do that when we go in and talk about the successes on other projects and how they were delivered with it. Was it a lease lease back or design build or even a multi-prime that it's, it's done better. You showed some metrics. The, the, there's, there's no, there's no um, uh, there isn't any litigation. The change orders are very low. The project finished on time or early. Uh, the, we didn't exceed the budget and all of the successes that are involved in that. So I think that's, for me, that's been a way that it's, there's been a success in, in sort of getting someone to change from um, a, a really strict design bid build, low bid so, mentality. So let me go to the clients. <laughs> oh, well, well. Yeah, go ahead. I think this question might be for Pablo, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Stephen Roper, College of the Redwoods, Director of Capital Projects. We have, um, by the way, thank you all for the $2 billion. We're going to spend it wisely. <laughs> we have a uh, unique campus situation where we are seismic zone four, and every time we dig a hole, we find a new fault, which results in us coming to DSA for a new building. We have a, a situation with classroom spaces that um, we'd like some direction on how to accommodate. Um, we're looking at some way of providing a space for the instructors that is essentially collapsible. So one semester we might have 55 students in a pre-calculus class, and the next semester we have a classroom shortage and there's only 22 students in the same space. We'd like to figure out some way of making that space that accommodated 55 students into two 25 student classrooms. We need to know how to do this from an architectural perspective to include fire life safety. You know, how, so do we make how do we make sure that we have it built appropriately to begin with so that it can collapse into multiple spaces or multiple uses for that space? So, so, so what you've got, you've got five or six questions there. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to really break it down and see if we, because we'll have time during the rest of the day to talk more in detail. But the, the question, if I heard you correctly, is how do we handle the flexibility when classes, class sizes change from semester to semester or period to period? 
And that, still be able to utilize that space. Of yes, the, of course, of course. And to make sure that they're, utiliz they're utilized appropriately. I want to I'm start with, with you, Laura, or, or do you want to answer uh, Pablo? Uh, no, well, I'm not at the chancellor's yeah. office, but. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean working with them. Oh, yeah. The um, uh, you know, so I, I, I'm not sure if your question has to do with code um, or. I think he's talking about from a design standpoint. From a code standpoint, that's really, this is 5,000 feet in the air, folks. Let's keep it there. But from a, from a big picture standpoint, how do we handle the need for flexibility when classes are changing and moving back and forth in terms of size? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, uh, that's one of the things that drives cost, right? That, that uh, adding inf additional infrastructure to allow for various options. Uh, you know, one of the things we found is that we've been trying to get away from a lot of our tiered classroom spaces. Um, unless you're talking about a large capacity, 100 plus, because the inefficiencies in a space like that to meet all the ADA requirements and so forth make it difficult, but it also limits your flexibility in those types of spaces. Um, when we start looking at um, trying to have a space that's flexible to go from uh, 22 students, like you said, to 55, um, you know, we, we look at things like um, using uh, movable wall systems and so forth. Uh, I will tell you, though, that uh, you know, whether you put those in or not, that can have some significant ramifications on code. For example, um, we had a, we're, we're just finishing up the, uh, uh, at DSA on a STEM building at, at American River College where the president wanted to have a certain space designed a certain way and he asked that we add some movable walls. Well, the addition of that movable walls actually ended up requiring us to have to fireproof the entire steel structure of the building when we had not planned on doing that. So it added, you know, couple hundred thousand dollars I think to the project um, so you know there are some very significant implications even just aside from just access and exiting and fire life safety there you know there's that issue of you know having to go back and re look at the entire structure at that point but um, but I think at the end of the day for us it would probably be worth it for us because we have that flexibility programmed into that building for the next 50 plus years so I, I hope that answers your question somewhat Kathy yeah, if you want to talk about, let's go back to project delivery. Yeah. So, so I did want to address this because I get asked this question a lot, um, and you brought it up as well. How come you hard bid? How come you design build? How come you lease lease back? Um, it's actually we go through a process of evaluating the scope of the project, the dollar amount, obviously, um, the time. When when does it? When can it start? When do I need it by? Am I doing other things similar in the area? Um, Sacramento, it's not that huge, but um, you know, do I want to bundle something that's a, a roof replacement on one side of the town and, and on the other side of the town? Probably not. That doesn't really lend itself to cost efficiencies. Um, I also look at the expertise of my staff at the time. Um, what, what are they doing? You know, do I, can I do this in-house? Do, do I need help on the outside? Um, I also look at um, the number of funding sources, believe it or not, that, that we're um, piling into a project, you know, with Prop 39 there for a while with um, ERP, Emergency Repair Program. You know, I, I had one project that actually Laura did for us. I had five funding sources on that project. Um, so it required, it required it from the accounting perspective and from like a pay app perspective, it was a little bit tricky. So a lot of, a lot of things go into the decision on, on how to deliver a project. Um, I also have a project labor agreement, which um, I have for everyone who doesn't mind working on a PLA, I've got another one that says, call me when it's done and I'll come work for you. So, you know, we look at um, what the availability of the bid pool is um, and, and will those bid, is it beneath my PLA limit, um, is it above, uh, have they done it before, you know, and then you get on to all the legal stuff, you know, are they pre-qualled and, and all that kind of um, uh, legal things that you have to go to. but. Um, it, it's definitely a decision that we don't broach lightly. Um, I, we do tend to go between lease lease back and, and hard bid. Mostly, um, I, I try and, and my, my staff, some of my staff are here, and they'll, they'll say, I go, what's going to be on the board? So there's politics involved, right? If I took six lease lease backs on one board meeting and nothing hard bid, I'd probably get a phone call. So I, I tend to um, mix them up a little bit. Um, I've been doing a lot of research on design build. I know Dick, Dick Cowan is in the room and um, I listen and learn from that gentleman a lot. Um, I would love to do a design build. I think, I think we'll be able to do that in the near future. Um, I think it's a pretty cool, pretty cool way of delivering a, a project. So. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, we're doing three uh, K-12 design builds right now, and I, um, I do think that there is a great opportunity there. Um, in this economy right now, uh, we all need to make our partnerships and our relationships um, because there just aren't enough people to uh, invite to your party, let alone that they'll come uh, to your party, especially if uh, the project is complicated or or you have a reputation as a client um, of not being uh, friendly to the community. So design build is a nice way to get your team on early. But I do caution um, everyone that it's not for everyone, uh, that it requires work on the district side. And there's such a broad range of delivery um, types even under the design build umbrella that depending on the level of control you need as an owner and participation um, that you need by your stakeholders and how um, how much you want to spend up front on criteria documents all of those things um, really factor into it so understanding if you're gonna uh, dive into the design build uh, arena you need to understand look in the mirror and decide who you are but also decide that uh, range um, of the design build delivery that you um, that best fits you as as a client type Brett, what, what are you, what's in there, what's coming up in terms of technology that might help us through this particular process and can change the way we've been doing business in a positive way? Uh, yeah. Um, so tech, we, we, we all love tech. We hear about tech every day. Um, but, you know, for what we do, we have yet to be really disrupted in, what we, in, in our work. Um, we define disruption as being when a business model fundamentally changes, and we haven't really had that yet. Um, other industries have, you know, Uber, Kodak, you know, your phone now replaces your camera and um, even going back to Pixar, you know, how they changed animation. Um, so, you know, it is coming, definitely. Um, I think that we, as an industry, are trying to come to terms with how we kind of approach tech. If we look at a cell phone, for example, we look at a phone and go, oh, I want to be able to look at RFIs and I want to be able to look at a model and I want to be able to talk in a basement, right? But what we really need to look at is you have a device that is a piece of plastic that is made with a global supply chain with optimization and des design automation and um, is making money for people. And we, we need to treat buildings kind of like that and kind of treat buildings like a product, um, really, and kind of change how we kind of engage technology. Um, my, well, well, I say that's while, while maintaining flexibility, yeah. while maintaining flexibility, <laughs> while maintaining flexibility. <laughs> Um, but so, so the disruption that we, we kind of see is, you know, the Kateras of the world, um, you know, they have a $3 billion valuation and raised $885 million. Or WeWork, who um, is kind of in the same category, who is really fundamentally changing um, operation and design of, of office space. So um, once, once we prove how to go forward and how we can attack a vertical, um, venture funding will pile on and, and we'll, we'll extend that into other verticals, I think. Okay, so let me jump to the finance side or to the financial side anyways. How do you make the decision? Everything's a priority. When everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. So how do you determine which project needs to go? Uh, what, what are the factors there? Pablo, why don't you kick it off? Because everybody wants everything. You already said that one. So, uh, we, we, you know, we kind of we kind of look at it from the perspective of, okay, what do we really need to provide? Again, what do you really need to provide, right? I, we need to provide a box, right? I need to provide a box where students can learn. And so, um, you know, if we start talking about adding a clock tower, right, or a monument to the architect, we, uh, <laughs> or, I mean, no, I'm sorry. Of course, that's what we want. <laughs> Isn't that why we're here, is to build monuments to us? I don't necessarily need that. However, that said, um, I don't want a campus full of boxes, right? I, I want a campus that will um, encourage learning. I want a campus that will meet the needs of our students. Uh, you know, need, the students are increasingly, um, the way they, they learn is by uh, their social interactions with each other and, and uh, using uh, different forms of media. So, you know, we need to provide certain things for them to be able to have an environment where they learn. But, uh, 
you know, we we try to uh, we try to keep in mind that you know we're not we're not there necessarily to build these monuments, but we need to make sure that we provide a in an, a, in an environment where the students are feel encouraged or can have their learning experience enhanced by the building environment that we create. Well, let's take it down a little bit farther, though. Uh, we know that we need to move towards a more sustainability. So I've got these older buildings that are good bones and they're really good, but can I, I need to spend some money to fix them up. I also know that we're going to uh, some new science lab that they're really pushing hard because that's gonna be the future for young people that are trying to get jobs. And there's also a need for construction people, so we wanna build, we need to start educating people in construction. How, how do you present that to your board of trustees and how, what, what do you do uh, on, on at any level in terms of making a decision? How do you drive the decision or do you drive it? Well, we, we, uh, one of the things we do that's very important is that we, we have to do periodic reviews and updates of our master plans at each campus, right? So that's a very large discussion. That can involve a lot of uh, user groups in that discussion. And so we do that on a regular basis to make sure that we're getting we're staying in the right direction. And that discussion includes all those things that you said, sustainability, educational needs. Um, one of the other things that comes in too is uh, our maintenance requirements, right? So I might have a building that's a real dog on campus and I would love to see that go. Uh, but uh, it may not necessarily line up with the educational priorities of the campus. So, you know, we have to have those kinds of discussions. But I think a valuable exercise for us is, is to revisit those master plans on a regular basis to make sure that we are meeting the needs of the students and that we are continuing to go in the right direction that you know our board wants us to go and the campuses need us to go okay. Okay. so as far as um, priority goes um, you, there's a lot of things that you need to look at and Pablo mentioned um, you guys have an awesome kind of work order sort of thing that's multi-campus wide so so work orders are obviously a good a good spot to look we still keep our deferred maintenance plan up to date uh, you know it's no longer required but we do it every year um, I have about 80 sites, so it kind of it's really in my best interest to keep that document up to date. You know, you also if you have a local bond, there's language in the bond, right, that will dictate how some of that money is spent. Um, your eligibility with the state: Are you eligible for mod on a project with the state? Again, that might move a project on my master plan up a little bit if my modernization eligibility is is there at the state level. I'm not building a lot of new schools. Um, haven't built a new schools since Western Placer, but anyway, and, and the average age of my, my school building, they were built in 1954. So I have a lot of renovation, um, still trying to meet those, you know, the 21st century classroom, all those little buzzwords that we hear all the time. Um, and we've done both. Um, at, at Kit Carson, um, Lyonakis did a new STEM building for us um, that had four science, two, two dry, two wet, and an art building, and a black box theater, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the same time, I'm doing a renovation in one of my oldest high schools, Hiram Johnson High School, where we're not building anything new. Um, we're, we're gutting the inside. And so the parameters of trying to duplicate some of the cool stuff that we did over at Kit Carson in a building that already has four walls and a ceiling is, is a little bit more challenging, but it can certainly be done. I think one of the, um, uh, and, and politics, we were kind of mumbling up here. Politics, politics always it does enter into this, it just does. Um, you know, whether you, you've got a, a board of trustees that's by area or, or they represent the entire district. Um, you know, you, you, politics does enter into it a little bit, but I, the biggest thing, the change I see recently, and this was a, with, with the um, hiring of our new superintendent, uh, who's been with us for a little over eight months, there's a huge focus on equity. Equity, equity. Um, everything should be made based on equity equity in staffing, equity in technology, equity in student support services, and equity in facilities. So we've been spending quite a bit of time actually um, evaluating, coming up with indices to rank our facilities and then coming up with, you know, how do we measure that? How do we graphically show that? So that, and this is, this is kind of the bottom line. When the board members drive and buy their site and says, man, that parking lot really looks like crud and I want you to go fix it, I can spit out a report in about 30 seconds that shows me that that parking lot's down number 37th on the list because there's 30, 36 that are a heck of a lot worse than that one site. So that's kind of the goal of, of um, where the money would go because it you know, doesn't make sense to spend money when on a site that doesn't need it as much as some other sites do. So, so you've automated, I'm gonna call it. We're working on it, we're working on it. And there's a lot of, a lot of um, ability, you know, facilities conditions assessment, the fit report's really good. Although only, it's only as good as the person who fills it out, right? Um, 
but it's a start. So, you know, your master plan, your bond language, when we write bond language, you know, you want to keep it generic enough to where you can do anything you want, you know, but you have to keep it specific enough to that the voters know what they're actually voting for and, and think they're going to get. Is that know, called, know is that called sleight get. of hand or something? Sli no, no, it's totally above board. <laughs> I think we should talk, though, um, you talked about disruption. I think that's important. Um, students have choice. Families have choice. They have it at the higher ed level. They have it almost in every K-12 level. So there is something about the facilities and the first impression of those facilities that drives choice. So the monument to ourself might actually be um, the uh, draw for a student or their family to look at a school and say, this is the right school for my my child and we see that all the time in a state that has a lot of declining enrollment in it yeah I, I just want to remind me of a situation I finished a high school in Los Angeles Panorama High School and I happened to be there the day that they brought in all the, the families for visits prior to it and it was a, the real monument and it's a great building but the real monument was walk, watching the jaws drop when they saw when they saw auditoriums and things that were totally different from anything that they had ever seen before because Los Angeles had not done anything at all in schools for a long time. So while they are important architecturally, I think the important part is what's the impact on the students, what's the impact on their families, and what's the impact on the community. Remember, and I think we forget this a lot, for most people, the only time they come in contact with government is either the library or the school in their neighborhood. Most people don't go to City Hall or to the Board of Education buildings, etc. And I think that's something that, that we do forget. I, I'm intrigued, though. I, I really want to push Brad a little bit on in terms of, of some of the technology, and in terms of, of the visualization stuff. The, the, what impact is that having now? How much of it are toys, and how much of it are really changing the way we do business? Um, yeah, I mean, we, there's, there's, we have a lot of VR and AR coming out, virtual reality and augmented reality coming out. Um, what the difference between augmented reality and virtual right. reality? Virtual reality is when you're closed off to the world. Augmented reality is when you have a partial vision of what you're looking at. And um, Tony Stark. Tony Stark, right? So there, there are uh, tools that are coming out that actually let you do that. So you can, you can take a, a model and overlay the model in a room like this and look at a change, or look at a delta, or look at information around you. Um, my firm is working on. Uh, VR and looking at data analytics for uh, design management and clash management. Um, so there's lots of things that, you know, really a lot of it is, is being driven by consumer tech where, you know, the HoloLens from Microsoft or uh, the Vive or any number of others are coming out with hardware and software that's very easy to go and use and we're adapting it from computer games and being able to put it, put architecture into a computer game and then inject it into a headset. Yeah. That's a, a really good point. I mean, when I was in practice, we were doing some really wonderful presentations, but we were, uh, every single time we were putting together in the early days, any of the virtual walkthroughs, et cetera, et cetera, we were competing with what people saw on television. And it had to become better and better and better. So the question is, how much is that influencing, the, how much can we hide through really good graphics? And I want to know whether we're beginning to change. Let me ask the school district folks, uh, how, much, how much snow do we use or do we get when we turn out a beautiful set of drawings or a beautiful walkthrough? Is that important now? So, Probably you hmm, too. question. Um, that's a good question. Um, VR is very cool and realize, you know, my kid has been doing it for a long time and it's like all new to me. Um, I saw my central kitchen in design through VR and it was the coolest thing ever. Um, I, I do think that that's, it's a super useful tool in terms of the designing um, component and I think we'll see more and more of that. I, I haven't done AR yet, but probably would get sick. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> VR is pretty cool. Um, I think from a classroom perspective, what's exciting is what we've just been talking about. All of these things that could be built into, designed into, or moved into a classroom, you know, whether it's brand new or not, um, you, you can always retrofit something. I think the challenge goes to um, things like a funding source. Um, you know, I don't want to buy a $400 Chromebook 
for my new classroom and finance it with bond funds for 30 years, right? So there's just some other parts of that that have to get into the decision-making process. You know, can I sell short-term bonds and therefore um, fund those things that are eligible as furniture and equipment, but I probably don't want to finance, you know, I don't, I don't want to pay 5000 for a $500 Chromebook over the course of 30 years. Um, the sustainability of those things, the replacement of those things, I can't come back later, usually, it depends on your bond language, and replace all of that technology, which expires pretty quickly, right? I mean, phones are gone after a year. And they're not considered repairable, so they're, tr they're almost like a supply. Well, try hitting the CBO up for general fund dollars to replace all those supplies in a school, let alone a, 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 you know, or a classroom, let alone a school. So the, the sustainability of those, the replacement cost of those, the training, that we've put some pretty cool stuff inside of our, our classrooms, but I don't necessarily have the, the folks on staff to train people how to use it. Um, and then when they go away, what happens? So it's wonderful. I love, I love the whole concept of doing that, and it's certainly the direction. I, I don't even think we're moving. I think we're there. It's just being implemented. But I think there's some other things on the back end that we're not, we're not really addressing yet. It's like, it's great when it's open, and five years from now, it's like, oh, shoot, these are old. What do I, how do I want? I need new ones. Well, who's going to pay for that? So. Well, that's an interesting issue because it not only is about the virtual tools, but it's just about systems and buildings. Mm -hmm. We are at a very interesting time in terms of our maintenance and our, and our facilities people. Most of them work with a screwdriver and a wrench, and yet the next generation, it's all gonna be on their iPhone or their iPad or whatever the heck they're walking around. So how do we handle that when there are some tools for, that can really help reduce the cost through, uh, through design? but yet you don't have the maintenance people to keep it up. So what are you folks, what are you doing, Pablo, in terms of new it's systems? It's difficult. I mean, you know, you, you know, you, while you've been at DSA, have been able to make some fairly significant uh, changes that are technologically based. And it's not easy. <laughs> it's very painful. No, it's not I mean, easy. <laughs> I had, and I'm sure you do. I have people who work for me that have been there for 20, 30, even a couple that have been there for 40 years. Uh, I mean, you know, they have to be part of the, of the solution, and sometimes it's hard to bring those folks along. <clears throat> so um, the technology of BIM being around for 10 years is great. I have to tell you, I honestly don't think that we exploit that model anywhere nearly to the level we should be and that I'd like to, but, but it's also very difficult to do that. Um, you know, and making sure that you have the in-house capability to really exploit it to the level that you can. And, and, it, it, and you, can, you can get so deep into that, you can get so much data into these models, you know, um, that not just help you in the design phase, but obviously into the long-term maintenance of these facilities, but, but it's, very, it's a challenge. And, and I think that um, we're going to continue to see that. I do see my workforce changing. I do see that some of these typical traditional journeyman trades are converting more into, uh, you know, more uh, peop folks that are sitting at computers monitoring systems, uh, people who can program systems. So we're seeing, you know, more low voltage guys because, you know, everything becomes more technologically based. Um, so I, I am seeing that as well. But, but in time, you know, we, we will catch up, but we'll never be at the bleeding edge of, of the technology because just as a public institution, you really just can't do that, I, I don't think. I want to just take a couple minutes and open it up to the audience to see if there's any specific things. Yes, Dick. Um, Dick, can you hold one second? He's going to. Dick, can you hold one? He's bringing a mic over for you. Yeah, I know you do. But there's some people behind you that can't hear you. Dick's an army guy. He can sound off. All right. So for Pablo, would you take a moment and talk about the community college uh, concept of total cost of ownership? And then have you seen that change anything among your uh, leadership? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, it, it, I have to say that's not a, a uh, it's a question that we do address, uh, but it's not something that we spent a lot of time on. Um, you know, we have, uh, what we do do is, we have a fairly good set of design guidelines that we have learned through pain and suffering uh, of things that work for us and things that don't work for us. There are things that we try not to put in our buildings, things that we want to put in our buildings, which, which help us get to that, you know, increase the value of our facilities and so that we're, you know, the total cost of ownership makes sense to us. But, um, 
but we don't have in terms of analytical data you know have not done that yeah. to it's a great degree. Inter interesting and I don't know what the exact number is but in most valuations that I've seen the cost of a building over a 50 year period the cost of construction is somewhere between 80 I'm sorry, between t uh, 15 percent and 10 percent, and the rest of it's in maintenance and, and all the people, and et cetera, et cetera. Yet, when you only have $50 in your pocket, you can't think about that long-term cost. We've got to figure out a way to make sure that we don't build really good buildings and then watch them fall apart because we don't have the money to maintain them. Or even simple things like there's a movable wall in here that's supposed to break this thing off. Who moves the wall? And it's got to be a wall that really works because we need to have real silence between, or not silence, but, but uh, sound uh, control between them. Let me see if there's one more question. If there is not, then we're going to... Okay, I just want to thank each and every one of you. And I wish we had more time. This is a great subject, but we've got a lot of things going. Thank you for everything. <laughs>